Great, thank you so much, Scott. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here in Houston. Uh, first time for me, and it's been a, uh, a, lot, of, uh, a lot of fun today. I already uh, saw a great school uh, a little bit earlier, and it's a great pleasure to be able to address all of you who are actually in the field uh, doing this on a daily basis and making it happen. And I said at lunch, and I'll say it again, it's the same thing. It's, it's intimidating for someone like me to come here who's, you know, what have I done? I've written a book, and here you are, the people actually executing on a day-to-day -day basis. And so, uh, my deepest admiration and respect goes out to you because you're the, you're the real people who are making change uh, and a difference happen every day. So I appreciate that. As uh, Scott mentioned, what uh, we did when we uh, wrote the book, Disrupting Class, was we took this theory of disruptive innovation and uh, applied it to the uh, public schools and the public education system. And of course, the first question is, well, what's this thing called disruptive innovation? And that's a good question. And my co-author, Clay Christensen, is a professor at the Harvard Business School. Don't hold it against him, but uh, he, uh, when he entered academia nearly two decades ago, he came in with an interesting question. That question was, why do successful organizations fail? And it's an interesting question because it's fairly obvious why poorly run or poorly managed organizations fail. But why successful ones would fail is a lot harder to answer, and yet it's what you see throughout history. Organizations that were once at the top, a generation or two later, certainly in business, are in the middle of the pack or at the bottom of the heap. And the question was, why do you see this happen again and again? And as he did his doctoral research, he reached the oddest conclusion. It was the very principles of good management taught at places like the Harvard Business School, that while really good for a company on the way up, ultimately spelled every organization's demise. So it's a very counterintuitive thing, especially for someone like myself who's a graduate of the Harvard Business School. But I'm recovering, and I've been working on this for the last few years. And uh, what basically that the explanation he came to uh, has been articulated as the theory of disruptive innovation. And uh, what I'm going to do today is really what we did in the book, what Scott just said, which is talk through some of the theories from uh, our research in disruptive innovation, explain the theory, uh, and then step outside the education system and apply it, uh, looking from a bird's eye view, as though we put these theories on like a set of lenses, to diagnose the root causes of why our schools struggle, and then if we understand that, how we might be able to innovate uh, to create some positive change. So what I'm going to first do is describe the uh, basic disruptive innovation theory. What I've done here is uh, plot on the y-axis the uh, perform performance, and it's over time on the x-axis. And this represents basically any field or marketplace you might see in any organization or business. And what you see in every field are that there are two trajectories. The first trajectory is a relatively flat one. It's the pace of uh, performance that customers can utilize or absorb over time. And the reason it's relatively flat is because our basic needs as individuals, our basic jobs that we have in our own lives, don't change that much over time. They stay relatively constant. Now, of course, there's a continuum. There's some people uh, who are not very demanding at the uh, bottom here. And there's some people up at the high ends who are very demanding and never satisfied. We all know those people. Uh, but for the most part, us as individuals, our lives stay fairly constant. There's a second trajectory also, and this one you'll notice is much steeper. It's the pace of technological progress uh, over time. <coughs> now there's two interesting things here. First, on the left side of that diagram, you'll notice that whenever any technology comes into a uh, marketplace, it starts as not good enough for the majority of customers in that field, meaning that they can't really use it and aren't very happy with it. But over time, it rapidly improves, much more so than our needs change. And over time, on the right side, it greatly outstrips the ability and overserves, actually, what we actually need in the marketplace. Overserves us. And the way to think about this is to think about those early uh, personal computers in the 1980s. You remember those machines? You'd sit there and uh, pull up your word processing program and you'd start to type. And every once in a while, you have to stop 
sort of coast the thing along to try to catch up with you. And that's because the basic Intel 286 chip inside of those personal computers wasn't even good enough for a basic application like word processing. But Intel improved it quite dramatically over time, introducing multi-core processors and so forth, Pentium 4s, that over time have greatly outstripped what ordinary people like myself certainly need. Of course, they're demanding people at MIT who are still clamoring for ever more improvements. But for the most part, most of us are now pretty well satisfied and in fact overserved by the technology. We don't need the extra performance improvements and speed and so forth. Now, these year-to-year -year, uh, improvements that improve technology sometimes are these small little incremental uh, improvements. Other times they're giant breakthrough innovations. But we call them all sustaining innovations. And the reason is if it sustains a company's uh, place, their trajectory in the marketplace, and the technology's trajectory in serving customers, and sustains what they already do, it doesn't matter how technologically difficult the innovation is, whether it's that year-to-year -year thing, <coughs> that giant breakthrough thing that said no one said was possible, no one said was not possible, they figure out a way to get it done. Doesn't matter how technologically demanding. And what that means is that incumbent organizations or businesses uh, almost always win sustaining innovation battles. Even if a high-flying entry company comes in with that really cool technology that seems to leapfrog someone, when the dust settles a few years later, almost invariably the entrant withdraws or goes out of business and the incumbent organization is still left standing. Now when Clay was doing his research, he noticed that there was a second kind of innovation that came along occasionally. And he called this one a disruptive innovation. It's been a, perhaps an unfortunate choice of words for it, to be totally honest, because disruptive implied new or breakthrough or better. Uh, but he didn't actually mean it by that. What he meant was disruptive because it disrupted the original technology tra trajectory in that marketplace. And uh, it was actually not as good as the existing technology. Because it wasn't as good, it couldn't go in that existing trajectory and it had to come down to the low end and serve people who were less demanding and pave its way in there. Uh, and over time, of course, it would take root and it would improve over time to the point where it would displace the original technology and it would transform the world. Now, interestingly enough, disruptive innovations almost always tripped up the incumbent firms. For some reason, they just couldn't grab a hold of it. And entrants would nearly always win these battles of disruptive innovation. So why was this? What was going on? Well, what I've done here is uh, take the uh, disruptive uh, marketplace diagram and put it, in, put it in the back plane there. You see the uh, different trajectories of the customers and so forth. And the uh, products and services in that plane there are almost always complicated, expensive, inaccessible, hard for us to consume. And disruptive innovations, while not good enough, really come out in the second plane of competition and target people who are unable to use those expensive, complicated technologies in the back plane and make something that's good enough available to people who weren't previously using it. That's why we call them non-consumers. They weren't using it before. And then this new plane is much simpler. It brings convenience. It brings affordability and accessibility. And as we said, over time it improves, starts to bring the complicated things that only the uh, back plane technology can do into the front plane, draws the business out, and the old firms in the back plane end up going, uh, end up collapsing over time as the disruptive innovation takes over and transforms the world. And almost all of us are better off because of it, because it's brought convenience, simplicity, affordability, except of course the unfortunate companies in the back plane who go out of business. So how does this uh, actually take place? Let me give you an anecdote to put some, uh, to make it real. Uh, in the 1970s and 80s, there was a company in Massachusetts called Digital Equipment Corporation, or DEC. And DEC was the most widely admired company of its kind. It's sort of like the Google of the 1970s and 80s. And they built what, uh, what we call mini computers. They were called mini computers not because they were particularly small, but actually because they were just smaller than mainframes, which would have taken up about a quarter of this room, 
and the mini computer would have only taken up about an eighth of this room. And uh, mini computers were very uh, demanding uh, technology. They were very advanced, did complicated calculations, cost a lot of money, as you might imagine, for such a big machine, and uh, were very useful for corporations and universities with very demanding jobs, uh, needing very demanding calculations. And whenever you read in the popular press why DEC was such a good company and can need the best of its time, the explanation was always they have great managers and they have the best engineers in the world. That's generally the explanation we read about why a company is really good, right? Really good people. So then in 1989, with the same people at the helm, an interesting thing happened. Within six months, the business just collapsed, literally went off a cliff. And when you then read uh, accounts of the popular press for why this happened, the answer was bad management. <laughs> managers were pretty dumb. They just didn't see the personal computer comment, just didn't get it. So when Clay entered academia, the question he brought with him was, well, why did smart managers decide to become so dumb? <laughs> Except in this case, it didn't actually make any sense. That's usually the question we frame, right? In the top of the press, those bad managers, they just didn't get it. But in this case, it didn't make any sense. Because every single mini computer business collapsed within those exact same six months. And as I said earlier at the lunch, while you might uh, expect them to uh, collude on price on occasion, something not unfamiliar, I suppose, to Houston, to collude to collapse is a bit of a stretch of the imagination. And yet that's what happened. So what was actually the causal forces going on that caused, it, that caused this to happen? So if you dig deeper, what you see is that in the 1980s, the managers at DEC were getting two kinds of business plans, really, coming to them. The first kind said, right now you build these incredibly complex mini computers that you uh, charge clients quarter million dollars for and you make 45% gross margins on them. People love them and, and so forth. And we've been listening to our best customers and they're just demanding an even better mini computer, the next generation, if you will. And if you build this more demanding uh, computer that can do more things for them, you can charge half a million dollars and get 60% gross margins. And our customers will just love us for it. So we'll make more money and they'll be happier. Win-win. The second set of business plans came to them and said, you guys just don't get it. You would just get up off your seats and look out the window. You see that there's this thing called a personal computer. And it's coming up fast, and it's going to change the way the world works. So management would get up out of their seats, and they'd walk over the window, and they'd look outside. And sure, they saw the personal computer, but what they saw was a very different picture. Compared to the mini computer, this was a pretty crummy device. It couldn't do the complicated things that its customers needed. When they asked their customers what they needed, they certainly never asked for a personal computer didn't have any use for it. And then they looked at the uh, profits that the business plans for personal computers promised. They saw that they could make, excuse me, charge $2,000 for these computers and make 40% gross profits in the good years, but it was going to quickly collapse to 20%. So the decision management phase was this. Should we make better products for our best customers for better profits or should we make worse products that our customers can't use and won't buy for profits that will kill our business model? What would you have done? Probably the first one. That's probably right. And that's exactly what DEC did because it makes logical sense. So they went and did that and were pretty happy for some time, except that out here in the new plane of competition, the personal computer was getting better and better and better started to be able to do more, more complicated things in that back plane, and all of a sudden I had accessibility to be able to, instead of bringing a bunch of punch cards to a computing center, I could do spreadsheet calculations and so forth on my little personal computer on my desk, and it blew the mini computer uh, companies out of the water. Now how did those companies with the personal computer do it? How did Apple and those companies change the world? They made an interesting decision. They did not market 
the personal computer to compete against the mini computer because it just would have failed. It wasn't anywhere near as good. What they did was they marketed it as a toy for children, a toy for hobbyists. And yeah, it wasn't as good as the mini computer, but they didn't care because they didn't have a computer yesterday. They sure as heck couldn't afford one. And so they were just thrilled to have a computer that they could do some computing on because it was their, better than their alternative, which was nothing at all. And Apple and the others uh, entered there, made a profit, kept improving it, and changed the world. This is a phenomenon now that we see not just in technology heavy industries. We see it all over the place. So I've put up a list of uh, companies that have been disrupted up there over the last many years. Uh, you can see that it's pretty widespread. It ranges from cars to department stores, uh, to, to phones, to, uh, to copies, to, to office copiers. Let's, uh, let's delve in a little bit on one of these just to give, it more, give more meat to it. Um, let's take the first one, the cars. Toyota has disrupted Ford and General Motors. Now, how did Toyota do it? They didn't uh, come in at the top with the Lexus and go head to head. They entered the market with this crummy car called the Corona in the 1960s, which rusted pretty quickly, wasn't very good. But for people who couldn't afford the gas guzzling cars from Detroit, they were thrilled to have this alternative because it meant now they could have a car and get around and, and drive. So they didn't care that it wasn't all that good. And Toyota made an entrant here, got a beachhead and improved it over time. And then they came out after the Corona, they introduced the Tercel and then the Corolla, and then the Camry, Avalon, Forerunner, and then the Lexus, and disrupted Ford and GM. Now, Ford and GM, their managers weren't dumb either. Occasionally, they'd look down at the market and say, you know, we really ought to go compete with those buggers. And so they'd send out a Pinto or a Chevette. <laughs> but when they compared the margins from those cars to those from the unmitigated blessing of being able to sell yet another Cadillac Escalade or a Ford Explorer, it just didn't make any sense to put the marketing push behind the uh, Pinto or Chevette. And so they'd pull it out, and that would allow Toyota just to keep on coming up market. And by the time Ford and GM really got what was going on, the game was over, it was too late. Now, Toyota's being disrupted today. Now, I know you have it on your sheets, but we jumped ahead a little bit. So, even before Cherie on there, who's disrupting Toyota? Inc incidentally, they don't feel it because uh, they have the privilege of stealing market share from Mercedes-Benz at the high end. But they're being uh, disrupted. <coughs> Kia. Kia, exactly right. Kia and Hyundai, the Koreans, are coming up and disrupting uh, Toyota. They basically own the subcompact end of the market now. They win all the awards down there. And uh, behind uh, the Koreans are the Chinese and Cherie, and of course, no one need worry about India and Tata, because I'm sure they'll never be good enough. <laughs> but there you have it, it's going on and on, and, and we see it over and over again. Southwest Airlines disrupted the major airline carriers, and air taxis today are starting to do the same thing. Uh, you've got Walmart and the uh, discount uh, retailers who disrupted the department stores. And Walmart, Kmart, and Target, and of course Target's gone up market and become Target, <laughs> which has left room for the internet and the retailers to come in and start disrupting them, and on and on. So an interesting question is, what are the established organizations doing when they see a disruptive innovation come in? And for this, uh, I want to take back to the 1950s and 60s into the consumer electronics industry as it existed at that time which was really the vacuum tube uh, uh, companies. And these vacuum tube companies like RCA uh, built tabletop radios and floor standing televisions, really big products that were, pretty, that were pretty good. And they were powered by these vacuum tubes. And in 1947, out of Bell Laboratories, uh, scientists and engineers there invented the transistor, which was an exciting product, potentially disruptive. It was pretty small. and provided power, not as much as couldn't handle the same power loads that the vacuum tube did. But RCA and all the other companies saw it, said, hey, this is, this is pretty exciting. Took a license to it. 
We threw the transistor into their labs and framed the problem as one of technology. If we can just make the transistor better, we can keep improving it, and eventually we'll be able to swap it in for the vacuum tubes, and we'll be able to you know, build some pretty exciting products uh, in our floor standing televisions with that. So they framed it as a technology problem, invested, adjusted for today's dollars, one billion dollars, trying to perfect this technology. And they never got there. Because the hurdle, the technological hurdle, as it existed at that time, was very steep. And this was a very, very hard problem. So, and by framing it as one of technology, they couldn't get it there. So how did the transistor enter the market? That was the path taken by the vacuum tube manufacturers, which was simply to try to cram the transistor into their existing business. Well, the first application for the transistor came out of the market in a small thing called a hearing aid, which was just made for the transistor. Because it was pretty small, didn't require a lot of power, so the transistor was good for it. And the vacuum tube, which is about the size of your fist, uh, wasn't exactly great for a, a hearing aid. And so people were pretty thrilled with the transistor sitting there. And a few years later, this company, uh, this little company no one had heard of in Japan called Sony, introduced the first application of the uh, transistor to consumer electronic, which was the transistor radio, the pocket radio. And this was a horrible device compared to those uh, tabletop radios. It was tinny, static-laced. If you were in Salt Lake City, you had to face west just to get a signal. But who did Sony market it to? They had it actually pretty good insight. They didn't target it at the people who were buying those radios. No, they, they marketed it to the low end of humanity. People today we call teenagers. <laughs> and teenagers were just thrilled to have this device. Because yeah, it was a tinny and static device, but they didn't have a radio yesterday. And it brought total convenience to their life and portability, because they could take this run away from their parents, and listen to their rock music out of earshot. And so it was totally exciting for them. And so he had his speech head, made a profit, improved the technology a little bit, and uh, three years later came out with a portable television in 1955. And yet this product wasn't uh, as nearly as good as those four standing televisions at the time. But for people who had small apartments and smaller pocketbooks, they were just thrilled be able to have a television at all. And Sony once again improved this, and you can see where this is going. In the 1960s, they just blew RCA and all the other vacuum tube companies out of the water. And this is a particularly punishing tale, because RCA and all the others, they saw the technology. They spent far more money trying to perfect it than Sony ever did. But by framing it as a problem of technology rather than one of the model and how you introduce it, so they got blown away. The lesson from this is that technology can only be deployed in the existing businesses in ways that sustain and add cost to their current model. If we were to, were to hope for, a, uh, for uh, these technologies to make disruptive impact, we have to allow them to compete against non-consumption at the outset and create the space so that they can do so. One more theory uh, from our research, and then I'm going to jump into what this all means for education, which I'm sure you're all wondering right about now. So this uh, theory is uh, one from engineering. It's about the right product architecture depending upon the basis of, of competition. There's two basic types of architecture, um, architectures for products and services, if you look at it from an engineering vantage point. One is an interdependent architecture, meaning the way that one part in, in a product or service works, depends on the way another part works, and vice versa. And therefore, if I hope to build one, I actually have to build both of them, because I have to interactively design them to make sure that they work together. And when you have interdependence, it, uh, it, it basically maximizes performance, so it's very useful in that way. Um, but there's a trade-off. The economics of interdependence compel standardization. To give an example of it, think about the Microsoft Windows operating system. We're going to go in there right now and delete 10 lines of code because you wanted your own custom configured one. You'd screw up the way the whole operating system works. 
because those 10 lines of code work in very intricate ways with every single other line of code in the operating system such that you would screw the whole thing up. So what that means is, because it's so interdependent, that were you to want your own customized version of Microsoft Windows, it cost you roughly $500 million to get it. So the economics and the interdependence don't permit customization. <laughs> they, they compel standardization. Contrast that with the modular interface, excuse me, modular architecture, where the interfaces between parts are so well understood that it allows you to mix and match and plug and play best of breed components. And there's a trade-off on performance, but it allows for customization. The economics allow for it. And the uh, way to think about that is think about the Linux operating system that's disrupting uh, Microsoft Windows. The open source community can go into Linux and play with some of the kernels around the code, tweak these here, tweak that here, I don't need that one, and give you your own customized version of a Linux operating system for relatively, le for relatively cheap compared to the uh, Windows example. Another example is the Dell personal computer. Peel off the cover out of any Dell, and you'll notice that Dell doesn't actually make any of the parts inside the computer. And that's because it's completely modular. So they can plug and play different components from different providers, snap them together, and give you a great computer. And that's fantastic for us as, uh, us as consumers, because we can go to the Dell website and say, I'll have this much memory, that much RAM, I'd like that type of monitor, so on and so forth. And Dell will just piece it together. And voila, you have your customized computer that ships out 24 hours later. It's relatively inexpensive. So modularity allows for customization. How does this all apply to education? We have a number of insights that we talk about in the book. I've put a lot of them up there. And they're on your uh, sheets so that you can take them home as clip notes. But uh, what I'm going to talk about uh, tonight is the first two. I'm then happy to go in any directions during the question and answer, certainly. Uh, Talk more. But the first one is that there are conflicting mandates in the ways that we teach and test versus the way students and individuals, in fact, learn. The second uh, one is that computers have failed to make a difference in education, judging by any metric, test scores or learning output, whatever. Uh, and the reason is because we've crammed them into conventional classrooms. We want them to have a transformational impact and realize their promise. They must initially be deployed to compete against non-consumption. So we'll talk about what that means in a second. But first, something that we all understand and we all know, particularly I imagine uh, in this room, some, some, some rooms you have to convince them a little bit more, but uh, is that we all learn differently. We all know this pretty intuitively. The person next to you is unlikely to learn at the same pace or in the same way as you do. Uh, they're probably not interested in the exact same things. I'm clearly interested in some stuff that some of you might not be. Um, and what that means is that, uh, you know, sorry, let me, let me back up a little bit. The academics have started to catch up to this as well. Uh, we, we did this, you know, as people well before, but uh, in the last 25 years or so, people like Howard Gardner have been doing a lot of research to show that, uh, you know, he frames it as multiple intelligences, he lists eight of them, says in schools we mostly use the first two, linguistic and logical, mathematical. Uh, but some of us, like a, a Michael Jordan, for example, are incredibly bodily kinesthetic. That is, their ability to do what they do in a basketball court is actually resident in their mind. Um, some people disagree with Gardner and use other frameworks such as aptitudes, uh, motivation, and so forth. But, but the basic idea is that we learn differently. We have different learning styles within that, especially within different subject matters. Some of us are more written in certain places. Others are more oral. Uh, others like to play it out. Some are more deliberate about learning. And of course, we have uh, different paces of learning, fast, medium, slow. So what this cries for is customization in our schools. And yet we know that with certain exceptions, certainly, for the most part, the way schools are structured, there's standardization in the classrooms and at different grade levels. So if we're in algebra class and uh, it's time to move on to the next unit, even if we haven't completely mastered it, and that's going to be pretty important down the line for a whole variety of reasons, let alone the test that now looms, it's too bad. We're just moving on. Or think about it the other way. 
say you're in world history and you're able to master the curriculum in just a month, but it's a year-long course, you sit there for the rest of the time just totally bored and growing totally disenchanted with schooling. So why is this? If we know, especially as educators, that people learn in different ways, why does the standardization result? It may not be a surprise to you, but the schools are very interdependent. Their architectures are extraordinarily interdependent. We talked about four types of interdependencies in the book. There are others, but I'll just go through these. Uh, there's temporal interdependence. You can't study this in eighth grade unless you've mastered this in seventh grade. There are lateral interdependencies. Uh, there are demonstrably better ways, for example, to teach foreign language grammar in high school. But in order to do that, we would have to re-architect the way we teach grammar in the early years, and that would necessitate changes in the reading curriculum and so forth. There are physical interdependencies. We know that for many students, for example, project-based learning is a demonstrably better way for them to learn. And yet the way our schools are physically set up, uh, with, with the classrooms the way they are and so forth, it restricts the ability to do certain kinds of learning. And of course, there are hierarchical interdependencies with which we're all very familiar, which come in the uh, form of federal, state, local mandates that restrict what an innovative teacher or principal can do in a school. But of course it works the other way around as well. The skills that a teacher brings, their own intelligences, also restrict what the mandates can do. And so what this all leads to just drives us pell-mell toward standardization. And if you want to see it, just look at uh, how much it costs to educate a special education student with an individualized learning plan in the system. Two to three times as much money. Okay. So uh, the um, just cry it just brings us towards standardization, which would be all fine if we all learned in the same way. But as we know, and we talked about, we need customization. So these butt against each other. How do we break this thing? We need to move toward a more modular system. Is is, is one idea. And one way to do that is through computer-based learning. Computer-based learning can be inherently modular. I can sub in different programs to teach Michael Horn uh, physics in the way he best learns physics, or Clay Christensen in the way he best learns. Uh, there can be different paths through a software program so that I can be much more exposed to maybe video and so forth in certain units, and when I struggle there, it switches over to a lecture, or maybe a teacher comes over and helps me on the side, um, and so forth. But the next mystery, of course, is that computers have been around for three decades. We've been spending wildly on them in schools for the last two, spending over $60 billion in the last two decades on putting computers in schools. And they made barely any difference at all. So why is that? Well, the answer is we've done what most organizations do when we see something potentially disruptive. We've crammed them into the conventional classroom and school model. Larry Cuban out of Stanford has done some really interesting studies on this and wrote an interesting book about it. Um, but it's something that we can all intuitively go around most schools and see. We've crammed computers in the back of classrooms and said, well, you can do a little word processing now and maybe you can build a PowerPoint presentation or display something cool on the screen. Uh, or you can go to the computer lab and learn keyboarding. So it's a tool of teaching, but it's never been the case that a teacher, almost never been, so the teachers walked in and said, kids, today's a great day. Because we have this really brand shiny new computers. And I'm just going to step to the side. You don't really need me anymore. The computer's going to teach you. It's never happened, and we wouldn't expect it to happen. It's ludicrous on its face. And so if we really want computers to have that transformational impact, to be able to bring student-centric learning into the classroom and into the world, classroom maybe is even a misnomer, we've got to introduce it into areas of non-consumption, compete against non-consumption to really transform the model. And so how do we do that? That brings up the other mystery, which is if you look at public education in the US, where could non-consumption possibly be? We're all, for the most part, required to attend school. And so it's not very obvious at first. But if you actually take a deeper dive and look, there's actually lots of opportunities particularly in the high school level, which is what Scott was just talking about, with, uh, with the need uh, and opportunity to reform the school.
structure that has produced these results. And so credit recovery is a huge area of non-consumption, particularly in urban school districts. And uh, so what, what does this mean? Well, you all probably already know it, but a student comes in, fails algebra, and we say, yeah, sorry, we don't really have the ability to tweak this, you just got to move on to geometry. They need the algebra to graduate, and they also need the skills for other courses. Huge area of non-consumption where computer-based or online learning can come in and make a big difference. Suppose I'm also just struggling with one of the modules in, in uh, algebra. I don't really need to take, retake the whole course. The online learning program can figure that out and just help me with that one place where I'm struggling. Dropouts are another huge area that's just crying for a uh, solution. In the uh, urban areas, we know it's roughly 50% in high school, 30% uh, nationwide. Uh, just a huge area of places that are offering a different way to reach these students. And we can introduce a model here and, and make a difference. Uh, AP courses are another one. There are 34 advanced placement courses that are technically offered. I don't know a school that offers all 34. Um, and so there's huge opportunities because there's certainly students within the school who would love to you know, be able to take uh, AP statistics or something like that. Uh, but it's even worse than that because 25% of schools in the U.S. don't even offer advanced courses, period, as defined by Algebra 2 and higher or honors uh, English and things of that nature. So there's huge opportunities here in the high schools. Uh, homeschooled students, something that's growing, we, we know about that opportunity of non-consumption. Homebound student, home students, people who are sick, for some reason can't make all the school day. Uh, small rural and urban schools are most afflicted by this resource constraints. Uh, tutoring, traditionally the domain of the wealthy, and yet we know that only 20% of those who need tutoring get it. And uh, pre-kindergarten is another big area that, that we listed up there. But how might this work? Let's just look at a hypothetical and see what schools have actually done um, uh, as they've been moving up the market, and particularly with budget cuts. Something that I know is very familiar in Houston right now is given the current economic climate, probably only going to get more familiar across the country. Um, what have school boards done? Well, because of No Child Left Behind and other testing uh, policies by states and so forth, English, math, and science are really the most important, if you will, subjects. It's what we're really graded on. And so they've moved that to the top of the market, and everything else, the nice to have courses. We put some really nice to have courses on the slide, but but even more fundamentally, have gone to the uh, bottom of the market. And so, uh, in, a, in a district not too far outside of Boston, they had an unbelievable array of courses. Uh, but because of budget cuts, they recently, uh, a few years ago, had to cut German. And then the next year came, and they had more budget cuts, and they sort of you know rank ordered what was important, and they said. Can't offer statistics anymore to those students who were able to, you know, advanced enough to handle that. Who cut that? It looks like the yeah, psychology teacher is going to lose her head in the next year, and uh, I'm sure economics and the rest are not far behind either. But what if we imagine a very different response, rather than the one where the school says to the student who might want to take German, "Sorry, we just don't offer it here." What if we said? You know, it was nice your siblings, for example, were able to take German or whatever the course might be. And we would really love to be able to offer it to you with a nice teacher who's right in front of you and able to give you great help. But we can't, but you can still sign up for German. What I want you to do is sign up for German, and during the class period where you would ordinarily show up for it, you'll go to the library, hop on a computer, and go to apexlearning.com slash German and still take your German class. And yeah, it's not as good as having the teacher right there, but it's better than the alternative, nothing at all. And from there, the next year's statistics get, gets cut, and Apex Learning, or whomever the provider might be, improves a little bit and says, hey, we can do that for you too. The psychology, and on and on and on up. And you can see how this might play out. And the online learning is a lot less expensive than the traditional courses as offered. So the next question, obviously, is this actually happening, or is this some pipe dream we came up with in Harvard? Which is a good question. 
there's a lot of things like that. But the uh, interesting thing is that if a disruptive innovation is happening, the adoption almost always follows an S-curve. Meaning at the very beginning, on the early side, there's some early adopters who sort of creep into the market tentatively, check out the new technology. And at some point, the technology's improved enough, people have become comfortable with the idea, and the world flips, and people rapidly adopt it. And then, of course, it levels off again uh, toward the, um, uh, as it reaches the top of the market. The tough question, though, to know is, is an S-curve actually adopting, and when is the world going to flip? Because it might be a sort of pretty you know, gradual S-curve. It might be a really steep one. And so if I'm the incumbent organization sitting there in the back of this, looking at it, I don't know how to think about it. And it may not even be an S-curve. It may not actually be disruptive. It's something actually developing. So I'm liable to just say, well, it's 1% today. It's been growing at a linear rate, and I think it'll only be this. I don't really have to worry about that. Turns out there's mathematically a way to figure this out if an S curve is developing, when there's only one, two, three percent of the market uh, that's adopted it. The way you do that is you take the uh, percent of uh, new of the new technology as a uh, percent of the market share, divided by the percent of the old. So if it's 50 percent for the new technology divided by 50 percent of the old, it'll be 1.0, and you array the, uh, the line of the, uh, the points on a logarithmic axis. So 0 0.001, 0 0.01, 0 0.1 are all equidistant from each other. And then if an S curve is developing, what you'll see is it results in a straight line. It linearizes the uh, S curve. And therefore, you can see is something actually developing and is this something we need to start thinking about. So what's happening right now with online learning in our schools? We actually see an S curve developing and it's happening for in particular for public education, rather rapidly. 45,000 enrollments in online courses in the year 2000, now up to a million in 2007, just last year. 22 times growth, and faster. And if we then take the high school adoptions, which account for about 70 plus percent of those online courses, we see that right now we're at about one, a little over 1% of the market, and it's rapidly increasing. To the point in 2019, we see that 50% of all high school courses will be offered, at least in part, online. And so the world is actually changing rather rapidly, and there's a big opportunity to utilize this technology to bring in the student centricity that we would all love to be able to offer. And it's an exciting thing, and it's also a, uh, it's an uncertain time as well. So I'm going to stop there. And what I'd like to do is uh, have a QA and a with you, and uh, I know that there's plenty of things I haven't addressed in this, but I wanted to give an overview for the work, and hear from you, Pat Calls, whatever you might want to uh, push back on, or, or, or ask genuine questions either way, uh, so we can talk about this. And uh, thank you very much again for having me here today.